I love these Zoom platforms. Um, when we can't see each other physically, it's always good to uh, see each other on Zoom. But I really want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I should say that last month was uh, Women's Heritage Month, and I am so honored and thrilled that we have an all-star cast of women community leaders today. So again, thank you for joining us today, and thank you for joining um, our discussion about the Japantown Cultural District. Um, as San Francisco, the nation, and the world finally start reopening uh, safely, people are eager to reconnect and rediscover their city. Um, and now is the time to celebrate the organizations and the people that are keeping our neighborhoods and organizations thriving. Mm -hmm. um, and we are proud to be working with Square to celebrate our neighborhoods and our community leaders in this program today. This is the second of uh, six programs highlighting our cultural districts in San Francisco. Uh, today's forum is uh, we're highlighting the Japantown Cultural District in District 5. It's prob prob District 5 is prob probably the most diverse district in San Francisco, and it lies right in the heart of the city. So, rem and remember to stay till the end because we'll be announcing uh, some fun gift certificates to uh, Linda's store, uh, Paper Tree in Japantown. In today's program, uh, we'll hear from local leaders who will paint a high level picture of the special neighborhood and the role their organization is playing in preserving and promoting the district. So let's get started. Uh, my name is Vasky Neris. I am a small business advocate. Um, as an immigrant from Greece, I actually grew up in the back of my father's grocery store. Uh, we had stores in the Mission and the Excelsior. And um, I really enjoyed meeting people, talking to them. And later on, after I studied architecture, I actually studied, uh, started my own uh, small business. It was called Zinc Details, and it was in the Fillmore for about 20 years. It was a furniture design store. And about seven years ago, um, I became the business uh, development director for the Council District of Merchant Associations. And we helped uh, oversee the maintenance, security, and marketing of all of our amazing neighborhoods. And then during COVID, I started this agency. It's called Next SF, and we create private public partnerships to promote small business. Um, and the neighborhood corridors of San Francisco. So again, um, Japantown is very near and dear to me. My store was about two blocks away and um, it was always a source of inspiration culturally and idea wise and the people that keep it thriving always inspirational for me. So um, by the way, a cultural district is a geographic area in San Francisco that embodies a unique heritage and receives financial support from San Francisco. Each district is defined by its residents, cultural and historical contributions to the city. So for example, these districts may have locally owned businesses, music venues, colorful murals and festivals which define a, a particular cultural district. So before we begin our program, uh, we have a few housekeeping rules. Today's webinar is being recorded. So if you miss something or uh, want to share it, um, we'll have it up on our website, our YouTube channel, or you can wait for the follow-up thank, e thank you email from us as well. So it's been over two years. You guys are experts on this Zoom platform. Um, if you have any questions, please drop it in the Q&A section up above, and we will ask the question to our panelists after they all present. Um, so now, uh, please sit back, um, get comfortable, Enjoy your favorite beverage and uh, we'll start the program. I'm proud, first of all, I am proud to present uh, Martin Guerrero. He is the Community Affairs and Small Business Advocate at Square. Um, I wanna personally thank you for helping our small businesses here in San Francisco. We've had a great working relationship for many, many years and um, you've been a true small business advocate and you've seen the value that our communities and our community leaders are adding to our community and our culture. So um, I know Martin had a few words to say, so I will let Martin take it from here. Welcome. Thank you, Voss. I appreciate it and welcome everyone. Yeah, the work you guys have been doing that we've been doing together has been fantastic. I'm really excited for, for the webinar series here to learn more personally about uh, the cultural district in Japantown and um, again, happy to sponsor to give voice to folks to be able to, to talk about 
the district and what all is happening there and how folks can support. So other than that, I just want to sit back and listen and learn from, from everyone else. Thank you, Martin. Thank you for being a true advocate. Before we begin our program, uh, my friend Dominic has created a beautiful video montage of the district, and we're gonna show it before we start our program. So take it away, Dominic. Aren't you inspired to go visit Japantown? And now we get to hear from these amazing community leaders. Um, I'm so honored to have this all-star cast. Um, so first up, we've got my friend Susie Kagami. She is the manager of the Japantown Cultural District. And you guys are doing so much to pre uh, preserve the economic cultural life of this special community. So take it away, Susie. Hi boss, thank you so, so much. Um, it's such a pleasure to get a phone call from you and all the work that you do to highlight all of our cultural districts and what makes San Francisco so great. Um, within just seven square miles, our city is a beautiful interwoven mix of authentic, rich cultural communities. It's where I grew up and it's a city I'm really proud to live in. So I'm here to just give a little history about Japantown. San Francisco Japantown is the oldest and largest of three remaining Japantowns in the nation. In the 1800s, San Francisco was the main entry point into America for, our, for the first groups of Japanese immigrants. After the devastation of the 1906 earthquake and fires, the Japanese community was segregated to the Western addition where we created a vibrant community of residents and business owners spanning over 40 blocks. Displacement though struck us and our community hard first with the 1940s um, with the unjust World War II incarceration and internment of Japanese Americans for over three years. And then again in the 60s and 70s, the San Francisco Redevelopment Program bulldozed our neighborhood to create the Geary Street Corridor and the Japantown you see now, landmarked by the Peace Pagoda and a robust Japantown uh, tourist destination. Despite displacement, we are strong, resilient, and even having to rebuild twice. We have our fellow cultural communities to thank, especially our surrounding neighborhoods, such as the Western Edition, who safeguarded much of our assets while we are interned. But today we are working hard to ensure the future sustainability of our Japanese and Japanese American community in San Francisco today and for our next generations. With the city now, under, with the city now understanding the value of heritage and preservation, San Francisco cultural districts were formed by the Mayor's Office of Housing and Community Development in 2018. Their goal was to celebrate and strengthen the unique cultural identities of San Francisco neighborhoods, to preserve and promote diverse communities and cultural assets, and to ensure that residents and institutions thrive, and to formalize partnerships with the city and communities, um, cultural communities we have in our districts. The Japantown Cultural District was honored to be the first and one of the one of eight existing cult San Francisco cultural districts today. Our Japantown Cultural District is still resilient. We have the highest density of seniors in San Francisco. We have over 60 arts and cultural education and nonprofit institutions serving youth, seniors, and the overall Bay Area communities. We have a community-based newspaper and online hub with a Japanese American and Pan-Asian focus catering to a worldwide audience. 
and we're home to over 10 legacy businesses and four historical, historically recognized landmarks just within our five block radius. Yet we still have a lot, a lot of work to do since our families no longer live in the area because of historical display, displacement or housing affordability, as we all know, which is very high in San Francisco, many only return to engage in our festivals or raise their children in our schools or youth programs, attend church, participate in language and cultural arts institutions. And due to the pandemic, we've missed our community greatly over the last two years with festivals, schools, and programs being shut down. But to address the return of our community and as the pandemic uh, allows us to open up, the Japantown Cultural District is excited to launch COHO. COHO is a co-creative hub and will be a J Japantown Visitor Center that honors the Japanese and Japanese American historical narrative to give voice to our immigrant ancestors the strength and resilience of those who endured the internment experience, our displaced residents, and the narratives of who our generations are today, longing for connection to place, purpose, and pride. Our community is transitioning right now. We are now four to five generations Japanese American. We are mixed race, we're Shin Issei, and we're proud of who we are in this community. So through creative placekeeping, COHO welcomes and fosters an intergenerational, multi-ethnic creative community that we can all call our own. COHO allows us to tell our stories, welcome visitors near and far, and will serve as a beacon for Japanese and Japanese Americans to return to reconnect with authentic culture and community, and to preserve and revitalize Japantown for many, many future generations to come. So I invite you to visit our website as we launch this new adventure, um, cohosf.com, or you can find us on Instagram at cohosf. Uh, join our mailing list and follow us and be a part of our journey to regenerate Japantown for our future. Thanks, boss. Bravo, Susie, that's so beautiful because there's so much commonality. There's so many things that bring us together and bridges cultures. And we're so fortunate in San Francisco that we can crisscross the world with these cultural districts and, you know, tr do a sampling, you know, of the different uh, neighborhoods. So thank you again. Um, and I'm sure there are many volunteering opportunities, right, with all the events that you all produce. So if you do want to be more involved with the community, please reach out these or to these organizations to uh, volunteer and also just come and enjoy, you know, the diversity of people from all over the, the city, all over the Bay Area and outside of the Bay Area coming to enjoy these festivities. So thank you, Susie. Um, next, we're going to go to my friend. Um, she has a beautiful shop uh, in Japantown. Um, beautiful artifacts, artistry, um, and I encourage everyone to try their hand at making origami because it's good for the body and the soul and the mind. So I wanna introduce Linda Mihara. She is the owner of Paper Tree. Uh, take it away, Linda. Thank you so much, Voss, um, and welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm here to speak about the merchants and the different businesses that you'll find when you come to Japantown. I grew up here. This is this is my home, and I've seen it change throughout the redevelopment phase. Different businesses uh, closed, different businesses open. But uh, did you know that Japantown is home to twelve legacy businesses? And if you don't know what a legacy business is, it's a business that's been around at least thirty-five years, uh, and it is um, kind of crowned special by the city of San Francisco to be um, kind of featured and preserved and hopefully nurtured to continue doing what they're doing. Uh, for Paper Tree, this is our 54th year in business. So we are one of those legacy businesses. And uh, yay, uh, the oldest business now um, is Soko Hardware. Soko Hardware at the corner of Buchanan and Post 
is going to be celebrating their 100th anniversary in 2025. So they are currently the, the oldest business in Japantown. And then we're, we're just the young kid on the block compared to them. And we just recently had a, another legacy business close that was Ben Kyodo, who was famous for their manju and mochi. And I know that you've probably seen them featured in a lot of, you know, um, uh, news uh, stories be, based on that. Uh, they've been around since uh, uh, for 115 years. So that was our our oldest business, but now it's Soko Hardware. So uh, the legacy businesses really afford, um, it. they kind of build and anchor Japantown. And we all have our different um, aspects of culture that we bring to Japantown. And uh, our store, Paper Tree, we feature uh, a wonderful selection of papers from Japan. We also are called the Origami Store because of our huge selection of origami paper and books. We just started opening up in-person classes. And I also um, support uh, the art of origami by having a free class that I offer on Zoom. Yes, Vass, I, I agree with you, Vass. Um, the Zoom is a great platform. And uh, it's a free class that you'll find um, on Eventbrite. And uh, I hope you can join me. It's uh, 10 to 11 every Saturday morning. We also have a wonderful uh, YouTube channel of all the videos from all the past classes that I, I did. So you can definitely try your hand at origami. Um, just grab some paper and then just you can definitely join in on the fun with that. But we, of course, would love to have you come and visit our store because in addition to the paper, we have some amazing origami on display. It's kind of our world class origami exhibit of amazing origami from all the top artists in the world. And it's really something to see. So when you come to Japantown, it's, it's jewels like our store, Soko Hardware, that has amazing uh, Japanese tools for gardening and the seeds and all kinds of wonderful things. But really, I think Japantown is correct, uh, cu currently is identified by all of the amazing restaurants that we have. So you definitely want to come to Japantown. You can get a wonderful sushi, you know, experience. Uh, you can also go to Hikari Sushi and do like the bullet train sushi, which is kind of cool. The, the sushi is de um, delivered to your table on a, on a bullet train. And that's very, very Japanese. So you can get a, an immediate culture um, sampling there. We have uh, two amazing grocery stores where you can get your Japanese goods. Uh, and if you're into ramen, everybody's into ramen now. We have an amazing selection of ramen restaurants. And in fact, right next door to me and on Buchanan and also inside the Japan Center, you will you won't have any problem. The, the only problem you'll have is trying to figure out where you're going to eat. So you need to come to Japantown multiple times and really try everything. Come for lunch, come for dinner, bring your friends, bring your families. And um, as Japantown opens up and the city opens up, we've noticed, or at least I've noticed, an amazing, everyone's been coming to Japantown. If you come on the weekends, it's really quite festive. Um, we're starting to see the tourism come back and they they love Japantown. Everything is such in a small area and you have such a variety of things. There's no shortage of finding anything Japanese here. So whether it's a retail shop like me that has some wonderful Japanese goods or any of the multiple restaurants that we have, get your grocery fix at um, either um, uh, Nijia or um, uh, across the way at, uh, um, I can't think of the name of it right now, but right across the way there. And, uh, you know, really spend the day here and really enjoy. Uh, there's so many wonderful things. In addition to uh, seeing and eating, uh, there's also a history walk that you can um, actually explore that will probably, uh, Grace might talk a little bit about that later, but uh, you get to find out about the history of Japantown through these panels that have some amazing information. And uh, we love, love, love for you to come to Japantown. I think you'll find an amazing experience your bellies will be full and happy, and uh, you'll really have a wonderful time. And uh, just even being out in the plaza or being where the cherry blossom trees are, where the Pagoda Peace Plaza is. And um, also come this weekend. It's the second weekend for Cherry Blossom Festival. So that's the time to come and get your cultural fix. Uh, so we aren't uh, having a parade this year, but we have all of the wonderful cultural exhibits 
Uh, we're doing origami right in front of the store here. We have a food bazaar going. We've got some performances out on the Peace Plaza stage. So that's Saturday and Sunday. So definitely come for that. And if you can't make it for the festival, come to Japantown during the week and, and get your cultural fix through the food and the, the wonderful uh, retail shops. So that is what I have to say. Just come on down to Japantown. Bravo. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. And I am so impressed the way you're demonstrating your innovation and you know absorbing these Zoom technologies to reach out to your, your existing customers, but also new customers too. And I just want to say you really hit the nail on the head because music, food, and art bring people together, you know, diverse people. And at the end of the day, this is what we need uh, to create understanding, even if we don't agree with each other, we can still have understanding for one another. Um, so that goes a long way. Um, and by the way, Buchanan Alley looks amazing. It's such a bustling, you know, thoroughfare with um, outdoor dining and shared spaces. And it's just wonderful. And especially this weekend with Cherry Blossom, it's a great opportunity to experience Japantown. So before we begin though, uh, Linda has generally, generously offered two gift certificates to her store. And um, we actually have one winner um, and it's my friend, uh, Edward Ang. Um, he's with, uh, so I'm so happy. He's a huge um, advocate for Japantown. So Ed, I'm gonna reach out to you and uh, you'll, I'm sure you know Linda's store very well. So um, congratulations again. Um, so next we move on to the Japantown Community Benefit District and the executive director is Grace Horikiri. She's a true wonder woman, <laughs> wonder woman in Japantown. I think everybody knows that. Uh, so please take it away, my friend. Well, Vaz, thank you so much for you know letting us all appear here today on this next SF webinar, and thank you to Square for you know sponsoring this um, important, I think, uh, cultural district information uh, throughout our city, great city. Well, the Japantown Community Benefit District, of course, is a benefit district that uh, uh, really promotes and works on the economic and environmental enhancements uh, for Japantown. So for that means uh, we provide cleaning services through our community ambassadors. Uh, we keep our streets safe uh, through our safe city cameras and through the economic side, it's really helping to market Japantown and getting the word out about what's happening in our J-Town uh, neighborhood. Like Linda and you know a few others, um, I kind of grew up in J uh, Japantown, uh, went to grammar school, Japanese school, and of course hung out at JCYC and all the various stores that are here. Um, you know, the Community Benefit District really um, made strides, especially during COVID. Uh, you know, we were really out there helping to support our small businesses Get, um, helping them with uh, applying for grants. You know, uh, we started the Heart of J-Town Resiliency Fund, which, you know, we were able to raise over half a million dollars to support our small businesses. And it didn't end just there. You know, we are still continuing. And one of the works that we've been doing right now is also supporting our artists because many of our graphic designers, artists are also small businesses. And so we've been kind of um, gathering them together and they've uh, just uh, completed our second new set of street lamp banners that will go up uh, right after Street Fair, I mean, right after Cherry Blossom Festival. And then they've also worked on murals that uh, you can see at the Kinokuniya building on the first floor. So uh, things like, like Boz, you were saying music, food and art, you know, brings, uh, brings everyone together. And it's really true. Uh, another hat that I wear is the ED for the Nihomachi Street Fair, which takes place, you know, in the summertime. And we'll have a few events coming up for that. And you can learn more from our website. But, uh, you know, working with all these ladies here, as well as other community leaders in our uh, in Japantown, we've been able to, you know, really um, help promote our small businesses. Uh, they still, you know, they, it's a lot better than... Um, uh, last year, but uh, I think we still need to support them. Um, 
uh, whether it's just going over there to make sure they're okay, making sure they still have masks available for folks that come into their store um, and uh, letting them know about any grants and um, funding that's available through the city or other places. So it's always about communicating to them, communicating to our community and communicating to the rest of the world about you know what's the happenings in J-Town. Um, I think that's it for me. Did I cover it? <laughs> you always have a full plate, Grace. I don't know how you do it. And you're always around J-Town. You're always there to lend all kinds of support. So thank you. I always see you buzzing around the neighborhood. Um, and uh, and I just want to stress what you were saying, Grace. Um, now, it, now more than ever, it's important to support our legacy and new businesses in Japantown. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm actually excited to uh, share. I just remembered we're doing a Japantown Merchant Walk with our friends at Beer Community. Um, so uh, if you want to be on that mailing list, it's a free merchant walk. Um, all you have to do is just email me your information. You can drop it in the email uh, in the notes section here and I'll put you on that uh, mailing list and we should have a good turnout. So we'll finish it up with uh, some drinks at, um, at one of the establishments in Japantown as well. So everyone is welcome to come. Again, thank you, Grace. Uh, so finally, we have um, a legacy community leader in San Francisco, and we're so happy to have her in Japantown. Uh, please welcome to the stage, Emily Murase. She is the executive uh, director of the Japantown Task Force in uh, Japantown. So take it away. Thank you so much, Voss. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with the movers and shakers of Japantown. Uh, as the relative new kid on the block, Voss asked me to start with my background. Uh, so I'll share a little bit about that. Uh, my father, Kenji, was the son of immigrant uh, sharecroppers from Japan who farmed the Central Valley, Reedley, California, outside of Fresno. Uh, he left the farm for college, but was kicked out of UC Berkeley and sent to an American prison camp during World War II because of his Japanese heritage. He persisted and eventually became a professor of social work at San Francisco State. Go Gators! Uh, my mother, Seiko, immigrated to this country from Japan to pursue a career in social work, eventually working for the city. I was raised in the city and growing up spent every summer at the Japanese Community Youth Council. Worked there in high school at Lowell and through college. This is where I first met Grace, who was an early role model for me. As a JCYC kid, you knew every corner of Japantown like the back of your hand. Uh, in 1973, my parents were among the founding families of the Japanese bilingual bicultural program now at Rosa Parks and Clarendon Elementary Schools. My two now adult daughters, Junko and Izumi, are proud graduates of Rosa Parks JBVP, as is Susie's son. And educational issues have always been important to me. In 2010, I became the first Japanese American to ever be elected to the 160-year-old San Francisco Board of Education and served two terms, including as president, thanks to the support of many of you in the audience. Uh, giving our public school kids an opportunity to learn world languages, including Japanese, was a big priority. And San Francisco offers Japanese language instructions from kindergarten to 12th grade in two elementary schools, one middle school, and three high schools. And we can have a separate conversation about our public schools at a different time. In January, I stepped into a new role as executive director of the Japantown Task Force, uh, literally returning to my roots. Uh, I'm doing my best to fill the very big shoes of Steve Nakajo, and I get to work with the inimitable Sandy Mori, board president, and Alice Kawahatsu, past president. And I see uh, Steve, Sandy, Alice, and several JTF board and staff members in the audience. Thanks for joining the webinar. Our mission at the Japantown Task Force is to preserve and develop Japantown, strengthen ethnic diversity, and create an atmosphere of beauty, vitality, and prosperity. Uh, you may know that before the war, there were about 80 Japanese communities across the country in such places as Denver, Seattle, Fresno. Uh, but today, as was mentioned before, there are just three remaining, all in California, 
Little Tokyo and LA, San Jose, Japantown, and San Francisco's J-Town. Uh, and without the movers and shakers on this panel, uh, J-Town would not be the vibrant place it is today. So I just want to touch on some of the major projects of the Japantown Task Force. Uh, one big one is the renovation of the Peace Plaza. And I see uh, Richard Hashimoto, co-chair of this committee in the audience. Um, some of you may not know that dozens of Japanese families and businesses were displaced during the redevelopment in the late 60s, early 70s to make way for the largely concrete Japanese Cultural and Trade Center and Peace Plaza which were designed with very little, if any, community input. So there's quite a bit of unresolved trauma in this second displacement of Japanese American families from Japantown. And to avoid repeating history, uh, the Japantown Task Force has made community input a central piece of the Peace Plaza renovation. Another project underway is the renovation of the Buchanan Mall, uh, where Linda's anchor Japantown business, Paper Tree, is located. And I see members of our city's design team, uh, Maria de Alva and Trent Tiger, here with us. Um, how many of you are familiar with the celebrated sculptor Ruth Asawa's origami fountains on the Buchanan Mall? Uh, I bet there's some of you though who have never seen water running in those fountains. Um, we are working on restoring this important water feature to its original glory. And the final initi initiative I wanna mention is Japan Tenna, uh, a project we piloted last November to showcase tourism and goods from one of the 47 different Japanese prefectures, Kagoshima located in Southern Japan. Over four weekends, we hosted nearly 6,000 visitors at a pop-up showcasing Kagoshima foods, goods, and attractions in an otherwise vacant storefront in the Japan Center Mall. Um, it was wildly successful, and the person who brought this vision, uh, Kenta Takamori, is also on this call today. Um, we hope to bring at least two additional prefectures to J-Town this year. And before I conclude, I want to invite everyone uh, to the 55th annual Cherry Blossom Festival this weekend, where you'll find community-based entertainment, unique crafts and gifts, including um, origami by, at Paper Tree and uh, the world-famous Terry Burgers. I see John Noguchi in the audience. He was uh, sweating it out over the hot grills last weekend. Um, We'll be there from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on both days. And just a pro tip, just blocks away from the festival. If you find the Japan Center Garage full, uh, you can go to the Rosa Parks Elementary School lot, uh, offering secure all-day parking as a fundraiser. So I'll stop there. Emily, what can I say? You're, we have four amazing Wonder Women on this panel. This is so inspiring, and I'm always inspired by Japantown. You guys are working, preserving the past, but you're also moving forward, and definitely strong future think in the audience here. And um, you're keeping the neighborhoods thriving. I mean, San Francisco's lucky to have you guys. Um, so thank you all for presenting. We have one more gift certificate that we're gonna give out. Um, so should we have a drum roll? No. No drum roll. Uh, so the next winner is uh, Christy Lee. Christy, we have your information. Um, I'll send a follow-up email after this program is over. I'll introduce you to Linda and she'll get that gift certificate for you. And I know you'll enjoy pa Paper Tree because it has so much to offer, not only in services, but products as well. And um, Emily, I'm glad you brought up uh, Buchanan Alley because that, in my opinion, that's one of the most beautiful well-designed pedestrian alleys in San Francisco. And I hope everyone has uh, walked through that area. It's such a model for urbanism and you know, preserving the past. And it's, it's textural, it's intimate, it's human scale. And I hope it never goes away because it's such a treasure. Um, anyway, thank you again for everything that you do, Emily. Um, and again, I want to thank you all for doing what you're doing to keep this community thriving, keeping it special, unique for visitors and residents alike. Um, so now uh, we have, uh, I want the audience to, um, you know, put your question in the Q&A. And uh, we, I did receive a, a text for some, from some of the attendees, of course. 
Um, but I do have some very um, questions for you, okay? Um, one of the, the guests has said, um, they're not too familiar with Japantown. I think that's, you know, I think not everyone knows Japantown the way we do, but um, paint for us a perfect day in Japantown. Uh, Grace, what would be your perfect day in Japantown? How would you start it and what would you do? Well, I'd first start off with a cup of um, uh, it's a sweet potato latte at Yakiniku Cafe. Um, go see my girlfriend there, Christy uh, Huang, who uh, runs and owns that uh, small cafe. And then I'd walk down to the plaza to get a COVID testing <laughs> because we are still offering COVID testing. And then I'd move on down into the Japan Center malls and uh, kind of cross over the bridge and go to Gina Bakes to taste one of their delicious baked goods, come back across and visit, you know, the stores like um, Daifuku Baishiki and Sakura Sakura, then mosey on my way to the Buchanan Mall, uh, Osaka Way, to drop in at Linda's store, Paper Tree, and across the ways to Forest Books, um, and also say hi to Phil at Soko Hardware. Um, and then lastly, uh, maybe run to Supermita to do any last minute grocery shopping so I can make some curry rice when I get home. So that's how I will spend my day in Japantown. <laughs> I love it. I love it because I think this is a common question that a lot of us have because we're all in our own orbits. We kind of do the same things over and over again. And it's kind of nice when we have community leaders saying, hey, by the way, there's this and this and this because we tend to miss a lot of things. So um, Linda, I'm going to ask you the same question. Um, and I know we should all go to Paper Tree, but apart <laughs> from Paper Tree, <laughs> what else should someone do in Japantown? <laughs> Well, I, you know, I'm very food driven. So I, you know, my perfect day is actually to start off by getting a pastry at Gina Bakes, if the line isn't too long, um, uh, or a pastry at Anderson Bakery, uh, get some coffee, um, come back to the store, wander through, you know, I always like to walk through the Japan Center. And uh, a lot of times I'll discover a business that just opened up. So in addition to the legacy businesses, we have some wonderful new businesses that have opened up. And so I need to know who these businesses are. So I'll usually discover that as I'm walking through. And then it's uh, time to figure out what to have for lunch. You know, I got to pick either um, ramen next door at Hinodaya Ramen, who has a dashi-based ramen that's fabulous, or I'll do a takeout uh, sushi from uh, Nijia. They have a great takeout section. So if you, you know, you can definitely go take out and then sit out in the plaza. If it's nice out, it's a great thing to do. And, um, you know, then wander through again, I'd make the same stops as Grace does. I'd pop in to say hi at, at Soko Hardware, uh, see what's new, what's happening. Um, walk over to, uh, you know, check out uh, Daiso and um, uh, just kind of walk around, say hi to everybody. And then it's time to figure out what to have for dinner. You know, we've got shabu shabu. I mean, there's so many different things. And, um, uh, you know, that's pretty much, I, I'd be more food focused, if anything. <laughs> Why not, right? <laughs> I, I would totally agree with you. And I, yeah. I should say that um, Japantown, you know, it's an authentic merchant um, environment. It's yeah. not a Disneyland. You no. know, it's not fabricated. There's uh, small businesses, there's bigger businesses, there's, um, you know, the famous Ben Kyoto, um, I'm, I'm, no, uh, the Kinokuniya bookstore. Um, you know, you can spend hours there. So culturally, there's so much uh, that one can discover. So thank you. Um, Susie, can I ask you the same question? How would what would be your perfect day in Japantown? Well, if I get up early enough, um, there's this incredible Tai Chi thing going on early in the morning where you can actually go to the Peace Plaza and under the Peace Pagoda, um, enjoy some a little exercise with multi generational folks. Um, but if you choose to kind of come a little later when the shops are open. My perfect day includes um, Mido, going shopping at Mido to get some stationary pens and um, a lot of uh, 
things that you might find in Japan that are fun for um, my son, if you're journaling and drawing. Um, I also love to um, go to, for lunch, I'd probably go to uh, Miguzo Udon, which is across from Kinokuniya. They make their own noodles. Um, and when you're in there, it's to me, it's the most uh, authentic in terms of feeling like you're in Japan for that, for that moment. And it's a great escape. Um, and then also Kisako tea downstairs. Um, they have a, a, their a longtime J-Town family a, a own business. Uh, their kids went to JBBP with my kids. They have an incredible selection of um, hoji cha teas from Japan. And you can also get mochi there um, that they bring in from San Jose. Um, and then I just love to listen to the kids, you know, the kids from Nihomachi Little Friends um, during the summer when the kids are all at Tomodachi uh, summer camp at the Japanese Cultural and Community Center. Um, they're all running around um, and it's just a beautiful sound to hear, you know, our next generation kind of walking through. So that's my day. <laughs> Bravo. That's beautiful. Emily, what's yeah. Emily's take? So uh, Grace already mentioned Super Mira, but there is a bakery inside Super Mira, Yaskochi Sweet Stop, and it's they're very uh, well known for their famous coffee crunch cake. For those of you who are old enough to remember, there was a Blum's uh, restaurant on California Street. Uh, before they closed, the baker there um, gave uh, Mo Moses Yaskochi the secret recipe to the coffee crunch cake that was very popular at Blum's. Uh, we have a very big tent in Japantown, and so one of my favorite lunch spots is Kui Shimbo in the East Mall on the second floor. It's run by Willie and May, who are Burmese immigrants. Uh, it's a very affordable option with a great variety of menu items from sushi to deep fried oysters to chicken teriyaki. And then I always stop in uh, Nipponya um, in the West Mall. It offers uh, affordable gift foods. Um, some people think after Benkyodo, there's no more mochi in J-Town, but that is not correct. We miss Benkyodo, but um, uh, at Nipponya, you can get uh, San Francisco, Japantown strawberry mochi in a gift box. I recommend that. And then when you cross the indoor bridge to the Kinokuniya building, don't miss Chato. It's a specialty tea shop owned and operated by two generations of the Fukami family. And you'll find an amazing selection of premium Japanese loose leaf teas and ceramics. And by now you'll need a snack. So as Susie mentioned, Kisako Cafe is a family run business. Uh, be sure to stop in Japantown Collectibles to say hello to Tony Urayama, a JBBP alum and pick up gifts for those who love Japanese toys and puzzles. And to end the day, um, you can go to Kipu Sushi on the corner of Post and Buchanan. Uh, the sushi selection is vast and good quality and say hello to the longtime proprietor, Green, who greets uh, customers warmly. Oh my God, you guys are amazing because I thought I knew Japantown. I don't know Japantown. So um, for those of us that were not taking copious notes, uh, we'll be sharing this recording and you can re-listen to it uh, leisurely. Uh, but we actually have a few questions. So let me go to the Q&A section. Um, where can we purchase Japantown sweaters like Grace is wearing? Grace, tell us. Uh, well, this one was made by um, Soko SF, and they actually have a website, um, and I could share that website with you in a minute as soon as I dig it up, uh, but they used to own the Pika Pika store um, in the Kinokuniya Mall, which is no longer there, but um, that's where, this is my uniform. I have tons of it. <laughs> I mean, I do. Represent. You got to represent. So uh, Lorraine is asking, what are some of the issues small businesses in Japan town are facing? And can you share some of what your organizations are doing to help with revitalizing Japantown businesses that were adversely affected by COVID protocols, closures, et cetera? Who's gonna take that one? Well, Linda? 
see. Well, let's see. Um, so from having a small business and going through the COVID, uh, first, I have to ha hats off to you, Grace, for being the main person to make sure that all the businesses were taken care of. She she walked the streets, made sure that all she popped into every single business to make sure if there was anything that she could do to help them out. She made sure that all of the grants that were available were either translated into other languages if they if uh, if English was not their you know um, original language. That really helped out a lot of the small businesses because it was really a matter of being able to have access to funds, basically, in, in a nutshell. So any grants that were available, um, any you know the PPP thing, uh, Grace made sure that she provided the information and that everybody knew that. So that was a huge lifeline for not just myself, but um, I'm sure all the rest of the businesses in Japantown and actually in San Francisco too. We were just lucky to have Grace to really help us with that. So I think um, the other thing that helps, I think, with the recovery effort is to have a good working website. And the website is going to connect all the people that were at that time, you know, supposed to be at home uh, and they couldn't come out to visit the storefront. Plus, we couldn't have people walk in. So having a website was really helpful for us. And I know that that helps with, you know, the, those other businesses that did have a website. Um, and so in Japantown, there was a huge support system uh, that really made it it certainly helped me out. Everything worked out and the grants kicked in just at the right time to keep me afloat. And so that was, you know, and uh, I have to say kudos to Mayor Breed for shutting down the city early. I think she saved a lot of lives in doing so. And I think um, the city did everything right as far as, you know, the, the safety of the, the um, businesses and restaurants in, in uh, the city. But in Japantown in particular, we had Grace and she took care of everybody. And that was really great. So I thank you, Grace, for that. And um, if, if anything, if none of that happened, if, the, if that uh, not having the PPP supplies to everybody like you did, Grace, and not having the access to all the funds and having everybody understand and support, um, Japantown would not have survived. And I think we were lucky that we did. Bravo. Thank you, Linda, and thank you, Grace. Thank you to all these amazing, mm -hmm. this coalition of neighborhood uh, um, organizations because I was getting the emails throughout the whole, and I'm still getting the emails from, <laughs> thank you, Grace. Uh, very informative, you know, highlighting the resources that are available, right. marketing opportunities, connection opportunities, and because uh, for small business, it's really been devastating. I think during the height of COVID, I think there was an estimate of 50% of all Smith businesses either closed down mm -hmm. or they, um, they, they changed their hours or working hours dramatically. So um, it's been really devastating. You know, we don't, we, we wanna recognize that it's a crisis moment for small businesses. Um, so it's, all of us need to pitch in <laughs> during this crisis, especially now that we're, we're lacking visitors and, uh, so it's really dependent on 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 uh, the residents of San Francisco. Um, anyone else want to address that question, or should we go to the next question? Let's go to the next question. So finally, Stephen has a very good question. He says, "What else can we do to support businesses being threatened with eviction?" Um, Grace, how would you answer that question? What else can people do? really just come out to support them. I yeah. mean, uh, you know, it is, uh, they need to make money. Um, and that's the only way that they can survive is if we continually support them. And, you know, of course, Japantown is a destination, you know, for visitors um, from afar to visit, but, you know, we really need to make sure our local residents come back week after week, month after month. Uh, to support these businesses because uh, uh, their livelihood depends on, you know, you pulling out your pocket and uh, pulling out that credit card or cash to um, uh, buy some goods. So maybe Emily, if you want to chime in on this one too. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. Shop and dine in Japantown. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Japantown, just let us know. We're happy to steer you in the right direction. 
Um, there's a fantastic new map of Japantown which lists all of the restaurants and the businesses that you can pick up this weekend at the Cherry Blossom Festival. You can also find it at other businesses. Um, the Cherry Blossom Festival is uh, needing additional volunteers. So if you want to come out and want to be useful, um, I know Melissa Bailey Nishi would really appreciate it. She's in charge of logistics. So I put the website to sign up um, in the chat. There are always uh, opportunities to volunteer, but really bring your family, bring your friends, buy your next wedding gift or birthday gift in Japantown. That's the best way to support us. Well said, well said, Emily. Um, and I just want to share, uh, share, you know, going to these events in Japantown, they're a very diverse group of uh, attendees and guests and visitors. And it's, you have everyone there. It's, and it's such a theater, theater of people walking around, enjoying everything in Japantown. Um, and if I might add, there's, there are many other ways that people can support the merchants. Uh, even if you can't go in place. I know during the height of COVID, we encourage everyone to buy gift certificates, um, order takeout, you know, because a lot of our small businesses now, you know, especially restaurants, they've learned to cater to the takeout community, whereas before they, they weren't necessarily used to that. So takeout still has a lot of value. These are different revenue streams for businesses buy gift certificates for yourself, buy them for your loved ones. There's always holidays coming up. Um, and then at the end of the day, you know, in many ways, God bless social media, but we're all influencers in our own way. And uh, we all have our audiences. And even if you can't buy something, you can also post it, share it with your community because um, these things matter a lot. Um, we're all walking around with these mobile devices and our eyes are always going to those screens. So the more impressions, the better. Um, oh my goodness, we got some more questions. Um, Aaron is asking, is a community land trust being created to buy Japantown buildings or does one exist? And I think Emily, you were typing something. Um, yes, yes. Um, and actually Susie can answer this question, Susie. Thank you. Yes, um, we are very hopeful for that. Um, we uh, are exploring options right now. Um, it is quite a great endeavor, but we are working with some nonprofits to get more uh, better educated on how to do that. Our, you know, as buildings within our community slowly become available as our elders um, want to, you know, retire or move out of the area. Um, we, we are seeing a need for a community land trust. So um, it's our hope and it's uh, really uh, what we've heard from our next generations within our community um, to, to develop one. So it is in the process and uh, we are hopeful that it will formalize soon. Excellent, I learned something new. Um, and then our friend from the Tenderloin CBD, uh, Lorraine Lewis, uh, hi Lorraine. Uh, she asked a question. Uh, so TLCBD uh, provides lease review and owner tenant negotiation support that can help small businesses that may have risk of uh, eviction. Uh, does this service exist in Japantown? Maybe I can answer that one. So what Japantown and the API community is very fortunate is we have a, um, API Legal Outreach who provides legal services and has helped many of our small businesses negotiate um, leases and kind of, you know, have been guiding them. So they are the ones that we've always been directing folks to in our community. Thank you. Thank you for that. So um, I just wanna thank you. I think we should wrap up the Q&A. Some great questions, um, great comments, good information was shared. And you know, this is the other value of this new way, new way of communicating on these Zoom platforms because now we can share our know-how, our experience because what the J-Town merchant community is facing is not unique. Many other communities are facing the same issues. So, by share, thank you for sharing your know-how and your experience with the community because people are listening. So I, I think we're, you know, you guys are having a nice, these communities are talking to each other. So that's important. So um, like all good things, um, we need to 
put an end to this amazing discussion. I want to thank you sincerely for joining us today. And I hope the audience has gained so much information on what you guys are doing to keep this uh, vital community thriving. It's an important community. So as you can see from um, this webinar, um, we are fortunate to be in San Francisco and it's, and for many people, uh, the Phoenix, some people don't know this, but the Phoenix is a symbol of San Francisco. The city is alive and well, and it is reopening safely. So we encourage everyone to step out of your door and go visit these shops and experience the culture and the, com the merchants of uh, Japantown. Personally, I've been all over San Francisco and I've been um, during, after uh, restrictions were lifted. And I can say that there's a newfound optimism and people wanna uh, enjoy and be with one another again and it, enjoy each other's company and the merchants. So residents want to um, discover, rediscover neighborhoods that they once knew. And the neighborhoods we all know, they're the gems of the city. And uh, it's now more than ever, it's important to be a tourist in your own city and discover things that you've always loved and discover new things as well. And we do wanna thank Square for allowing us to have this discussion uh, citywide. So that's why we've been highlighting these cultural districts and small businesses of these unique neighborhoods, which are beacons of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And with that, um, I bid you adieu until the next program. And thank you all for uh, joining us today. Have a good day. Bye-bye.